everyone. We're back here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin for our chapter book story time, and I am so glad that you're here with us today. So we're continuing to read Little Britches by Ralph Moody. This is the true story that he wrote about his experiences when he grew up beginning ranching in Colorado with his family. All right, so chapter nine is called Grace Tries It Too. I wonder what she tries. <laughs> Let's find out. I got away from home on Fanny a little after half past six the next morning. Father must have sat up kind of late the night before because he had made me a new sort of whip for the cows. It was the end of a broom handle about a foot long with a piece of harness rein fastened to one end and a raw hide loop for the other. The piece of rein leather was five or six feet long with the end sliced into four narrow strips. It was a lot lighter than the black snake Fred had lent me. Father showed me how to put the rawhide loop around my arm and snap the stick so that I could hit things with the split end of the rein. I didn't take any lunch that day. Before mother, oh, before, mother put me up sandwiches and cake, but I tied the package on my overall strap and lost it while I was chasing cows in the alfalfa. She said Grace would bring me a hot dinner at noon and watch the cows while I ate it. I was scared to death when I took the cows out into the road. I knew that they would run for Fred Altland's alfalfa as soon as we got past his house, and I was pretty sure I couldn't keep them out alone. That was before I knew much about Fanny. The Kikorans had one spotted brown and white cow that was skinny as an old hound dog. She was always way out in front of all the rest, and she could run like a horse. We were hardly past Altland's driveway before she started running for the alfalfa, and I knew the others would follow her unless I could head her off. I was just thinking about going after her, and I guess maybe I leaned forward a little bit. Anyway, before I clucked to her or kicked my heels or anything, Fanny was after her on a dead run. She almost went right out from under me. She started so quick, but I grabbed a hold of her mane and stayed on. We caught up to the spotted cow before she got halfway to the alfalfa. I planned to slow Fanny down beyond her and get turned around so I could drive her back with the others. Fanny hadn't planned it that way. When her head was a foot or two in front of the cows, she and the cow both turned. All in a second, I was the only one that didn't. It all happened so fast that I re never remembered hitting the ground. I scrambled to my feet, scared that Fanny would run for the barn at home, but she didn't. She stood and let me get a hold of her rein. The old cow was running back to the herd as fast as she had run away from it. The ground was as flat as a table, and I was panicky for fear I couldn't get back on to Fanny before the cows were all in the alfalfa. Then I remembered how Fred told me to climb on Ned's neck the day before. But first I had to get Fanny's head down. I ran over to the side of the road, yanked up a handful of grass, and held it out toward her nose. When she started to nibble, I dropped it in the road and threw myself on her neck as soon as she put her head down for it. Clever, huh? I took half a dozen more spills before we reached the pasture, but none of them hurt very much. Fanny knew all the tricks that there were about making cows do what she wanted them to. My biggest job was guessing which way she was going to turn and when. And all the way there were fields of alfalfa or oats along one side of the road so I could climb back on her neck when she put her head down to eat. Just before we turned into the pasture, I filled the front of my blouse with green oats. I knew I'd fall off some more and I had to have a way of making Fanny put her head down. Fanny was much easier to ride than Ned, even if she did spill me once in a while. The only time she ever took a trotting step was when she was slowing down to a walk or cantering. She could canter along as slow as old Ned trotted, or she could go like a streak of grease lightning. I found out that far, the farther I leaned over her neck, the faster she would go and maybe I ran her fast lots of times when I didn't need to. Grace thought, brought my lunch at noon. It was everything stew with a lard, it was in a lard pail and biscuits and a cupcake. When she brought it, my cows had wandered nearly to the south end of the pasture. So there were a couple of hills between us and our house. Grace said mother had told her to herd the cows while I ate and she wanted me to bend over so she could use my back for a stepping stone to get on Fanny. I tried to tell her that she didn't know how to ride and would fall off, but she got a mean, she got kind of mean and made me do it. I knew a couple of things about my fighting at school and riding on the donkey that I didn't want her to talk about at home. She didn't really say that she'd tell if I didn't help her get on Fanny, but she did remind me that she hadn't yet. 
I told her about clamping her knees and watching Fanny's ears. I was getting so I could tell when she was going to turn in which way, because she would point her ears that way first. Just as I got the lid off the lard pail, my old spotted cow started toward Carl's oat field at a trot. I yelled to Grace to head her off, and Fanny acted as if she knew exactly what I had said. She went racing off after the old cow as fast as she could go. Grace was almost lying down on Fanny's neck, and her bottom slewed way over to one side. I knew she wasn't squeezing with her knees, and I yelled her to, but it was too late. Fanny caught up to the cow, and Grace wasn't watching her ears. How she ever fell as she did, I'll never know. She was clinging to Fanny's neck with both arms and had dropped the reins. I had tied them together so they wouldn't fall if I let go of them. When Fanny turned so quick, it swung Grace out like a gate, and her feet came down between Fanny's forelegs, but she was still holding on with her arms. Fanny kept right on going until she had the old cow headed back. Then she stopped and just stood still. By the time I got over there, Grace was standing on the ground, laughing and crying all at the same time. <laughs> Grace had heard Willie Aldevote tell me that if you fell off, you had to get right back on and try again, or else you'd be too scared to try later. And besides, the horse would know that you were scared and you could never ride that one again. I knew Grace was frightened silly to get back on Fanny because she was shivering as if it were the middle of winter. But she wasn't going to let me be able to do something that she couldn't. So she made me bend over again while she stood on my back. That time she didn't act so smart when I reminded her about pinching her knees and sitting up straight and watching Fanny's ears. I told her her hands weren't very stout yet, just as Fred Altland told me, and showed her how to wrap the reins around them. She must have been even more scared than I thought she was. She started her going away from where the cows were, so Fanny wouldn't see some old heifer she thought ought to be chased. As soon as she moved one foot, Grace pulled up hard on the reins and Fanny stopped. I clucked to her, but Grace pulled harder and yelled at me to keep quiet. <laughs> keep quiet! Her pulling and yelling made Fanny cranky, and she began bobbing her head as she did when she didn't want to plow. Then she started going backwards so fast that she was almost sitting down. I yelled to Grace to let up on the reins, but I don't think she heard me. She grabbed hold of Fanny's mane with her right hand so that the rein went loose, but kept pulling with the other hand. Fanny began going around in a circle backwards, and I didn't know what to tell Grace to do. I guess we were both yelling as loud as we could, and the louder we hollered, the faster Fanny went around. <laughs> Can you picture going back in a circle backwards? <laughs> Father always used to say the worst things that you ever expected never happened to you. That's the way it worked with Fanny. I didn't dare tell Grace to slide off for fear Fanny would step on her, and I guess she didn't dare either. When I thought she was a goner for sure, she fell forward and hugged Fanny round the neck again. As soon as both reins went slack, Fanny stopped, and I ran in and got a hold of her bridle. Grace was glad enough to call it a day's ride and even bent over to let me climb on. It would have been easier to shin up Fanny's neck as I usually did, because Grace's back was wobbling around like a padded dog's. After I had cows rounded up again, she herded them on foot while I finished my dinner. Then she took the bucket and started for home. But when she got to the top of the first hill, she yelled back at me, I can ride better than you can any old day. I can ride her going backwards, and you can't. I didn't even bother to answer her. <laughs> I was afraid Grace might have ruined Fanny, but she didn't. I only fell off once all afternoon, but I thought I was sunk that once because I had to run all, oh, I had run all out of green oats to make her put her head down. I had planned to get some more when Grace was watching the cows at noon, but her getting in such a mess with Fanny made me forget all about it. I would pulled a handful of dry buffalo grass and held it out to her, but she wouldn't even sniff it. When I had my mind made up that I was going to have to lead her clear over to the oat patch, she hung her head down and I scrambled on. From that time on, Fanny and I had an understanding between us. If I fell off, she would put her head down for me to get on again. But if I got off by myself, I had to get back on the best way that I could. I had a little trouble getting the cows home that night. Leaving the pasture, about half of them streaked off ahead toward Carl's oat field while the rest dragged along behind. I went kiting, kiting after the leaders, 
and while I was getting them headed off, the others got past me by running up a little valley where I couldn't see them. Fanny and I got them out easy enough, but by that time the first bunch was back into the field a hundred yards or so further down the road. We raced back and forth between the two herds until Fanny was in a lather. But as soon as I got one herd out, the other was in. Carl's house was way beyond a hill, so he couldn't see me, but we were right in plain sight of Altland's. I kept looking to see if Fred wasn't coming to help me again, but he didn't. At last I woke up to the fact that I had to, that all I had to do was get them all out. Oh, all I had to do to get them all out was to let one herd stay in until I could drive the other up to join them and then drive them all out together. We got by Fred's alfalfa all right, and I was proud as I could be that I hadn't had to have any help all day long. I was still being proud of myself when Mrs. Kokorin came out with my quarter. She had a safety pin too. Instead of giving me the quarter in my hand, she put it into the pocket of my blouse and safety pinned it in. I left it there until I got clear out to the road on my way to Altland's for our milk. Then I took it out and put it in my overall pocket so I could feel more like a man. But I stopped Fanny in the bottom of the last straw before we got to our house and pinned it back onto my blouse pocket. I couldn't be sure Mrs. Kokorin and Mother hadn't cooked the idea up between them. Fanny was pretty sweaty when I got home that night and Father didn't like it. He told me that I was wearing her down because I hadn't learned to make my head save I hadn't learned to make my head save her heels. I made the excuse about the two different bunches of cows getting into the oats and how hard I had to ride to get them out. But father said, now wait a minute, son. Every time you've been inside all day, you've been playing cowboy, haven't you? Of course I had been, but I didn't know how father knew. I nodded my head. Do you want to be a good cowboy like hi? He asked, or do you want to play at being a cowboy? Like hi, I said, then spare your horse. A cowboy with a spent horse is in as bad a spot as if he didn't have any horse at all. I wouldn't waste his horse's strength any more than your mother would waste our money. That is, not unless he was showing off <laughs> for her benefit. Instead of racing around after every cow that strayed a few yards from the herd, he put them all at the back end of the pasture where he could see them from the top of the hill. Then he'd sit down and let his horse graze until some of the cows that had wandered far enough away that they might get into the oats. When he did go after them, he wouldn't race as you do. He'd go at a nice easy lope until he passed, until he was past the strays and then bring them back at a slow walk so as to keep them calm and quiet. Always remember, son, the best boss is the one who bosses the least. Whether it's cattle or horses or men, the least government is the best government. The next day went pretty fine for me. I only tumbled off Fanny once and I wouldn't have had to, and I wouldn't have had to that to that time if I'd grabbed a hold of her mane. Once the day before, I had got off balance and knew that I was going to fall, so I let go of the lines and reached my hands out to catch myself on the ground. I came down smack on my face and nearly broke my arms. This time, we were right in the middle of a sandy spot at the bottom of the little valley. I'd been studying all morning about the way Hai fell out of his saddle on purpose and somersaulted onto his feet, so I thought I'd try it. As I went off, I ducked my head and bucked up my hind end. It worked, but it worked too well. I went too far over in the air and came down on the seat of my pants with an awful thud. The sand wasn't half so soft as it looked, but at least I'd learned part of the trick of taking a fall. That morning, I herded the cows the way father had told me I would do it. They seemed to know I had learned the trick and I only had to go after them two or three times. The rest of the morning, I kept right on top of a hill where father could see me from our barn or from our bean field. But when I saw Grace come in with my dinner, I moved down into the little valley with the sandy spot. I wanted to show her that I could fall off on purpose without getting hurt and that I was brave enough to do it with Fanny galloping. I thought maybe I could do the somersault trick so I'd come right up on my feet. It didn't work any good at all. There must have been a big old jackrabbit that I didn't see sitting right at the edge of the sandy patch. I had Fanny going like 60 and had loosened up my knees, all ready to take my dive. When she set her feet and stopped dead still, I went off over her head a mile a minute. 
if I'd gone a couple of feet further, I could have grabbed the old, the old rabbit as he raced away. It happened too fast for me to think anything about any fancy landing, and I made a perfect belly slide. It walked the wind right out of me for a second. When Grace got there, I was all right, but I couldn't get any air into my lungs, so I could say so. She dropped my dinner bucket and came screaming like she thought I was killed. I don't think Fanny liked her very well after that day, after the day before, and she shied away. I was afraid she might run home before I could get my breath enough to yell, whoa, at her, but she didn't. My dinner was a mess. Mother had put the baked beans in the bottom of the bucket and then put a saucer on top of them with my Johnny cake and pie on top. When Grace dropped the bucket, it all got mixed together. It was lemon pie, too. All the time I was eating, Grace kept telling me that it was her duty to tell Mother about my falling off Fanny. I begged her not to, because I knew Mother wouldn't let me ride anymore if Grace ever did tell. At last, she said she wouldn't squeal, even if it was going to hurt her conscience. But I'd, but I'd help... I'd have to help her get on so that she could ride Fanny. She promised she wouldn't haul on the reins. Grace got on all right, but if I kept hold of the reins till I saw she was sitting right and had her knees squeezed in good and tight, then she was all right. Then I held Fanny's bridle and talked to her easy until Grace got the lines wrapped around both hands. Grace was all right as long as I had a hold, but when I let go, she leaned forward and grabbed for Fanny's mane. The, next, the minute she leaned forward, Fanny started to canter. Grace squealed, and I hollered after her to sit up straight, keep the reins tighter, but not to haul on them. She did sit up, but she hauled on the lines. I don't know whether Fanny was trying to be mean or whether she didn't know what Grace wanted her to do. And I don't think Grace knew herself. Anyway, she started trotting right up the little valley. Grace went bouncing up and down on her back like a marble, dropping on a stone walk. It wouldn't have been so bad if she had just come down in the same place every time, but sometimes she was clear up on Fanny's withers and sometimes pretty near back to her tail. First, she'd lose her balance one way, and then she'd grab a handful of mane and pull herself half off the other side. Why she never fell clear off, I'll never know. But she didn't. At last, she got worked way up on Fanny's neck and slipped over sideways so far that she was just hanging by her hands and one knee. Then Fanny stopped and let me catch up to them. Even at that, Grace yelled back to me when she got to the top of the hill with my dinner bucket. I guess I showed you who could ride best. You fell off and I didn't. Grace brought my dinner every noon and she always had something hurting her conscience enough so that she'd have to tell mother if I didn't let her ride Fanny. After a while, I just let her do it anyway, and she got so that she could do pretty well, but she was always a sissy because she found that she was going to fall. Oh, when she found she was going to fall, she grabbed Fanny around the neck. After a day or so, Fanny'd stop as soon as Grace started to hug her. I got so I could tumble into a sandy spot and hardly get hurt at all. And a few times I went clear over and came up on my feet, just like high. I didn't have any trouble with the cows after the first week. When June came, the days were hotter, and I didn't have enough to do for, for it to be interesting anymore. Mrs. Cochran stopped hollering so much about my running the cows or bringing them in too early, but she still pin pinned my quarter into my blouse pocket every night, and I always took it out and put it in my overall pocket until I was nearly home. <laughs> well, that's the end of Chapter 9. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.